the Happiest Sad Person podcast. We have Alessandra Jacobs. Welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right, we got Jason Stein from Dad from the Crypt. And hey. I'm not to make a movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, glad to be here. Got my my hands in lots of different uh, pots in the kitchen. <laughs> I'm your host, Sully. And basically been revisiting every other movie, TV show, franchise. And since we reviewed all the seasons, we might as well just sum up the moments. And tonight... <laughs> Got a West Wing themed one. So lo and behold, the John Wells produced Aaron Sorkin helmed show. Uh, Jacobs, uh, were you already kind of into political dramas or just very just simple wordplay, unusual kind of occasional legal and presidential thrillers? Yeah, I feel like the West Wing is such a specific show. (laughs) It almost like it's so specific, but it could be like any kind of different genre. And I was trying to do the timeline in my head of like, when I knew I was doing this show, I'm like, when did I first find the West Wing? And so I think it was either between ages of 10 and 12. I would have been watching reruns at that point, like through my parents, like HBO, like, I guess I just would have been able to access that. And then (laughs) Wind went beyond a few years. And then I remember finding clips on YouTube that reignited my interest, specifically mm. the the Blame It on the Bossa Nova song with Ainsley. <laughs> and then uh, That's very President ridiculous. Bartlett. <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know if there was an algorithm for YouTube back then or what, but like, I was like that, I saw that. And then it, I just started watching clips and then getting back into the show. So I haven't seen it in a while but I've always revisited it. I've always enjoyed it's fine. it. Uh, we we can't expect writer, everyone to so be Aaron as... Sorkin is like my... Yeah, we, we can't expect everyone to be as read up on it, but I mean, like, I'm sure now people are having to figure out how they want to watch it if they don't want to subscribe to HBO Max, you know? Right. <laughs> uh, how about you, Jason? <laughs> yeah, so I might be dating myself a little bit here, but I remember... <laughs> We're all going to be dating ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I remember when it premiered. I remember it was a pretty big deal, um back on the old network TVs at the time. And I was I was a senior in high school um, at the time. And I, I, I remember, because it was like all, all part of, I think it was part of the must-see TV. You Thursday night gotta TV. see this, yeah. <laughs> right, with like Friends and Seinfeld mixed in. Yes. Um, so it was oh. all like blocks. And ER, I was really into ER at the time. Um, but I remember I wasn't that into it at the beginning. I remember my parents watching it, so I would kind of sit, with them a little bit but you know i was in high school my brain was going a million different places and then uh i went to college and i didn't really watch much tv in college i don't think i even had like a tv or you know you just your college kids are just you come (laughs) home and then also then you first have the internet really to to explore so you don't have much time to sit and watch tv right Uh, now that you're in college now you're hostage to homework you're like ah tv when will that happen uh yeah that's been here Um, (laughs) So I, didn't, I so I, I kind of I remember the um I remember the big cliffhanger of the, of season one with the shooting. Yeah, I remember you know, I asking my I remember asking my parents about it and like oh yeah, no, he's fine because I was like did they really kill off the president? Uh, spoilers, <laughs> but I think I think we're just gonna put a spoiler warning over this whole episode. Yeah, uh, trigger Probably. warning, potentially spoiler warning, tons of key 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 moments. Do not recommend right. unless you want us to list highlights so then we get you stoked and then you binge it on HBO yeah. Max or on Prime. I but yeah, yeah no. so I, I remember like hearing about winning awards and stuff. So it's always kind of in the background. <laughs> and then I remember there were when I graduated college and I call, got my first like quote big boy job, they were playing reruns like Sunday nights. And that was kind of like my relaxation was to watch a couple of West Wing nice um episodes on rerun before kind of starting the week. And then nice. I remember it, I really got back into it when they did the whole Israeli-Palestinian conflict in season five or six. I can't, I can't remember exactly. I th- which I'm going to say it's five. I think, oh, I think it was the six. end of five. Oh, yeah. That, that makes better sense because six is more kind of who's going to be the next president. Season seven is now it's game right. time. Now we're facing off. <laughs> yeah. So I remember I saw like, like previous... them both. Impossible. <laughs> yeah. So I remember seeing previews on TV. I'm like, oh, that looks interesting. Let me tune in for that. And that's when I kind of started going back to it. I was working at a nursing home at the time, and my residents were watching as well. So we would I all kind of talk all the about Samaritans. it. Thank you, sir. Yes. Um, so we would get to talk about it. And I remember watching the finale was a big deal at the time. And then mm-hmm. um, when I met my wife, you know, before while we were dating and everything, she was really into the West Wing as well. It was one of the things <laughs> I think we bonded over initially. But she's also the type of person that likes to have a have a TV show on while she goes to bed. 
and the west wing was like her comfort tv show to go to bed so <laughs> we are like on a cycle of west of like we finished the west wing at least three four or five times a year it can be Wait, that who, kind of show I, I have seen people who they've done it with star trek they don't with crypt uh I, I know many misties mystery science theater fans that's yeah. that, that's their forte just go to bed and you know just watching that until you mm-hmm. literally chuckle so hard you literally pass out <laughs> just... well, yeah and her other show that she kind of moved on from because i think we just got so burnt out from the west wing is gilmore girls which though i am convinced that they are somewhat in the same universe i wouldn't doubt like, it some of the same like kind of actors if you were not a wb show or you yeah, like mrs Lanningham is in an episode there's a whole dar <laughs> uh, connection if you want to go if you want to really make some weird connections you could i'd go for it uh uh, I it's funny you mentioned connections there it, I went through all of St. Elsewhere in recent years and mm, there is a guy yeah. named uh, uh, the president's visiting in town his name is Bartlett and I was like oof I wonder Ooh. somewhere in some universe this is the shares <laughs> and it means it's part of all these other awesome shows <laughs> no it, it, I, but I'll be damned if John Wells or Aaron Sorkin didn't see that episode somehow and get inspiration but I don't know I don't know how those process works, but yeah. So I am so behind. I would always see parts of a rerun on Bravo and my, my grandparents were really, and uncle were really, really into it. Cause I think just kind of like, I got them into other shows kind of like uh, designated survivor, the unit 24, a lot of the other awesome government shows. Uh, Madam secretary was another favorite, but yeah. Ooh. So West wing somehow it's ironic. It started kind of the whole, walk and talk thing but i it was the last one on the list and uh it, it's kind of like when i was looking at some of the other gangster sh- uh movies and or even uh mystery show shows and procedurals i'm like there's no way it's going to be as good as this one that inspired that and i'm like sure enough they're all magnificent and i can't choose and this was much of the same thing we're just like see people who already know some of these other actors like Allison Janey from the other sitcoms and movies she's stolen the show in, or even Julie Hill from Psych. They're probably revisiting this, seeing because that for a drama, there are a ton of amusing moments and just dialogue where it's like, hey, even if it's too cute for its own good, that's just damn clever. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, and some things don't like quite age as well with the pages. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah some of the i mean kind of like how you would see some conservatives kind of like take 24 way too seriously i'm like guys it's just a tom clancy disaster yeah. show same kind of deal here i would see clinton's get angry at the show whenever they'd have a staffer who was inspired by this and wanted to get into politics i'm like why are you angry this is a good thing <laughs> you mean you can't fix the medicare in one episode or social well, security yeah. i mean yeah <laughs> they're they're it's like law and order where they're going to be playful and you gotta they have a passage of time but it's still is like okay technically still wouldn't happen in two months more like five months and then it gets killed in the senate floor you know mm-hmm. <laughs> it's bill that you're passing but it's a good idea and i mean some of the guest stars kudos to whoever was doing the casting on this um i think i'm on a f- intentionally starting with one of my favorite moments but like just season one alone when they announced to you here's the new Supreme court judge. We don't know just any judge and he's not agreeable on all issues. And lo and behold, you know, they, they keep you in silence and then they don't show you until like the end of the episode and the beginning of the next episode is like, Oh, and he's played by Edward James almost. Oh, awesome. I'm geeking out now. <laughs> but, uh, then it's interesting because you're then you're just like, and he's kind of a likable judge, even though I don't agree at all with his policy. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's interesting how they're opening up all these ideas what are reserved or progressive and then trying to even just kind of focus heavily on how would these guys probably get along and like coaching each other is like hey when i'm yelling at you it's not because i'm angry at you it's because i need your attention you know right and they actually bring up a good thing that like this was a show that i think even a lot of conservatives enjoyed a lot of Surprisingly. like surprisingly both sides <laughs> of the aisle. Like, had all the culture. I remember <laughs> no, I remember talking to people that, that were I knew were very conservative. And they said, "Yeah, I like the show. I don't agree with a lot of the politics of the main characters, but I like but the <laughs> the concept of public servants who on who truly honestly care, and to see especially at that time to see a commander in chief who is like seriously like weighing the human sacrifice 
against yeah. the interests of the country. You know, like those are the kind of things. It's the kind of things that we we hope our leaders are doing. Oh yeah, and even in an idealistic just, way. Well, that and even just showing how he's got the general vote, but he's still unable to pass many forms. Mm -hmm. I like that they kept that. Is like okay, well, so you're here, but your last term is never the most popular because this is where you're you're too focused on you know transitioning to the next administration and briefing them on what they need yeah. to know. But, but it's really a show with a lot of optimism. It shows all the a lot of the warts yes. in, our, in our government, <laughs> but it's optimistic that we can still make it through. Which make it through. Again, we're gonna, we're gonna have to get political tonight, but um, yeah, it'll happen. Yeah, but, it shows. You know, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. You know, it's no, the gray area. Sorry, it shows the gray area. You know, in politics, yes. which I think we don't get to see. And it shows like Bartlett every single time is choosing the, especially in like the scene where his granddaughter sent that um, Cabbage Patch doll or the Raggedy Ann with a knife yeah. in it because of the abortion thing. He's a middle ground guy on that. Like he, I would say he's more of the conservative ish take. And so. No, very true. He, yeah. But still, yeah. So it's I like would that. See allusions to ground. the Clintons, how they had a conservative background, but they. Were more closer to democrats and so yeah I, I did get kind of a what the young turks would refer to as kind of a corporate democrat kind of where he'll take a bribe but yeah, he's still gonna pass gay marriage and boom everyone's happy <laughs> religious president he's the catholic president you know what i mean like that's what i think that's what attracted well, martin sheen to that role is is i'm playing myself yeah. but now i i mean I don't think he would agree with the part where he's like, he's not sure if he wants his daughter, you know, played by a young Elizabeth Moss to be dating uh, a person of color, but uh, they, they kind of skip over that. That's really the only well, cop out I can think of. I think it was more, I don't think it was about his color. I think it's more just her dating anyone in general. Oh, okay. Um, I, it seemed like he was a like little... Played, they played that outdated. as like a joke, but okay. I, I don't think about the, that, that wasn't, I think they were making references to like, guess who's coming to dinner. Which is about you know yes. a black, bringing a okay. black man. That's kind of what I um, took from it, but I figured it was illustrating he was a little old school. That, yeah, wasn't that of the time? Too. I mm -hmm. think so. Like, where people really talk about it, it would sort of be inferred. Whereas now it's a little bit more like blatant, like this won't happen. Whereas back then it was like the quiet racism. So yeah, it's, exactly. It's, yeah, stuff I, that yeah. you can't admit I, to, but you're kind of before, but you have to show it in a different way and. The fact that they even bring up that he's got an MS illness, I think, was even more empowering, along with just showing, hey, you know, just like a director might have to take a leave of absence during the movie, same thing with any presidential office, you know, you might be away for now and you got to bring in your scandal-ridden vice president. You know, to, yeah, I mean, you know, just if we're going to talk about my favorite moments, we were, we were just talking about Barth yeah. and Bartlett's Catholicism, and you know, there's the episode Take the Sabbath Day, where we're there's yes. a um a big debate about the death penalty and uh, very you know, the, hard to talk about subject yes yeah when you know the, there's a final episode where he has he's talking to his home his home priest so this is like the priest that is older than him and he's like oh you're just the kid from my parish and now you can call the pope on the whim <laughs> and again it's showing that you have a you have a very religious pious president who is completely against the death penalty and every fiber of his being he knows exactly how to religiously, yeah. re religiously argue his way out of it he knows you know i could find a technicality but he knows the will of the people 71 percent or something like that right. are in favor and he's trying to do as president you're the elected representative of the people so yeah. he has to so what does what does he do when his strong hell personal beliefs clash with what everyone what else the, wants what the, the generally overwhelming population <laughs> wants and Again, it's like you feel for him, but he's making you know the choice that we would hope a president would make instead of self-serving choice. Right. Uh, I, I think they needed that. They just needed to show, hey, you know, like like Jacobs is saying, you know, it's it's gray. There's no way around it. There's not black and white anymore once you're in the thick of it. And to make it even more meta, just damn good casting of uh, John Spencer as Leo, the chief of staff. Mm -hmm. And to make it even more meta, you know, he was already, you know, my parents were big LA law fans. And what's funny is there's a CJ on that one as well, who he would often interact with. So I always wondered, just looking at this in hindsight, I'm like, was that inspired by one or the other? You know, that he come up with the naming? I, 
it's just a coincidence like likely but i'm just like yeah well okay if we're talking about latin and you know bartlett's religion another you know fan favorite episode is the two cathedrals yeah bartlett's secretary the feel for bartlett's secretary and again one of my favorite moments i'm just gonna keep listing off mine but um <laughs> is you know after the funeral bartlett his secretaries uh died tragically in a uh, car accident and um, that is so sad he's that having to so go through sad. this whole ms um and good act uh, disclosure actress, whoever that guy was she was great um uh, oh god i'm blanking her name but um Mrs. Yeah. Landingham. This is Landingham yes. was the act- yes. actress's name. But there's that scene okay. after the yeah. after her funeral where he yes. tells everyone leave the church, lock the doors. This is the National Cathedral. You can lay, you can literally lay the um, was it the Washington Memorial, the the big pointy one. Um, this is a huge cathedral. He wants everyone out. <laughs> he smokes a cigarette and curses out God in Latin, in, Latin, in God's own own quote language, uh, like that. that and like, I think we've all had that moment in life where you're just like fed up, you feel righteous indignation, and you just want to, mm-hmm. you know, kick the shit out of God. You're just like, you have wronged me, even though I believe in you, but God damn it, you're not helping me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Doesn't that show his, like, Bartlett's such, like, perfect, I, you know, idealistic mind where it's like he's still, at this point, I think if you were president, seeing so much war and death and pain. You would have eschewed a religion a long time ago. So it also shows this like naivete that he's still in it. So like when I was watching the show, especially like a second time, I'm like, there's something childlike about his belief that I've always yeah. found so bizarre, especially because I guess maybe that's the only way you survive that, that job. But like, I, I don't know. I, I just, it's, it was that connection to religion that I think tethered both sides, but it also made him seem sometimes incompetent in my mind as a watcher i'm also not religious i was did go to catholic school so a lot of that like naivete i saw growing up yeah so i guess i equated him with that it's he it did kind of feel like he had just constantly you know he'd gone to church you know just out of habit out of parents insistence and then now that he's the president now he can do whatever the hell and speak his mind and it just so happens to be, you know, in a crowded day where other people are using it, it's like, well, still got to, this is private. I can't have anyone else know what I'm thinking right here on the president's. This is literally, I always kind of took it as this is literally the only place where he can be private and have a moment to think to himself. <laughs> I mean, and I like how you brought that up because that kind of almost echoes in season three when he gives the okay for the CIA guys. And it's almost a Godfather level montage where <laughs> he's like, mm-hmm. I'm giving him the kill squad order. He just literally gives a thumbs up and he's thinking, oh my God, I just ordered a dead man dead. <laughs> and that's legal. But that's because also the CIA that, did it. <laughs> that Americana thing, that more industrialization complex that they also had to play into as well. A lot of West Wing is progressive values, conservative, and then like the corporate version of politics and like the American like imperialism. So Stuff it's, people it's don't weird. even want to talk about. Sure in congress yeah like, no more talk about. it's easier to just you know say have a handshake and say give me two thousand for my next campaign and i love working with you i'll make it up to you but again. <laughs> yeah well and there's one more again the pivot to another episode uh, the midterms where he there's a um grouping of radio personalities yes. and he uh lays into this uh religious talk show hosts dr jacobs mm-hmm. um which again season one i think he, no, i want to say season two it's yeah at least season two, two. They, they they waited to get comfortable before they brought up yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, the old metal i did write down the names of the episodes but i didn't write down the seasons and that's but though that's an example where he is using his own religious knowledge to dress down someone that is using religion to, uh using their their public pull a public um pulpit to dress down other people using religion yes and he's calling out her hypocrisy of twisting the bible's words right i don't think it would happen in real life but it's a good use of the platform to just show hey you know in this scenario let's say they could (laughs) yeah and that's the religious person that you want you want the person that's the the theology student you want them to be knowledgeable about it. I'm always impressed with people that have that vast biblical knowledge, 
-hmm. because I do take them a little bit more seriously because they do know their information. Do I maybe believe what they believe? No, but I, I am always impressed. Like I have get us to understand you as opposed well, to yeah. yelling at it, us to shut up because yeah, we'll get you. <laughs> well, it shows that it can be used both ways. It can use be used to bring people up or tear people down, it, it, just depending on how you interpret it too. Oh, totally. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to, you know, I'm la 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 la. I'm disliking everything I'm hearing. <laughs> I can't even listen to you for a minute because I've heard just toxicity, you know, and he, he's having to really even just find the right words at the right moment you know, to <laughs> just make it make sense in that essence. But he's got, you know, how it is that you have to actually force yourself to listen to the person before you have your retort. <laughs> and it is interesting how that whole scene, he's just studying his this person's his opponent and at the end of the episode he's like i must tell you how i feel because it's wrong in my opinion that speaks yeah, to that's interesting because yeah yeah it's like such a i re-watched some episodes and some scenes and i was like oh this reads like a play i've always yeah. appreciated Sorkin's walk and talks the language he's known for that but i was like oh this is like death of a salesman but set yes. in the political world it's that beautiful you're getting the best of every medium Good contrast, you're getting that most yeah. Yeah, the the language, the long speeches that you really can only do in theater. Most TV doesn't do that anymore. They need quick. No. So for him to combine all of that, I think that's what made it so magical. I, I totally. I, it definitely would make me, give me a Sidney LeMay feel at times, almost kind of like fell safe. And even his earlier work, you know, A Few Good Men, which started out as a Broadway play. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, it definitely, I mean, some of the same, it's so funny how even uh, people like uh, uh, David Chase, the creator of The Sopranos, was always just bewildered each Emmy season. He's like, how can people like this and my show? And it's like, it, it feels phony. They don't even, you know, curse like you would in real life. And I'm just like, and maybe because they got some of your same directors, is that an homicide? <laughs> That's, they're good at just making this feel legit. <laughs> It, well, yeah, mean, and it takes a lot of talent on like the director and editor side to make people like sitting in the room talking to each other interesting. It's like David Fincher talks about that a lot in a lot of his movies. Venture's about, a good contrast, the same kind of area of where you know, just trying to prove everyone wrong just because you're from a music video or TV short background doesn't mean you're incapable of doing a 40 minute episode of TV or an anthology. So, yeah, it is, I mean. All together, I mean, just all the real life events that they were inspired by, I mean, is even more electrifying. Like people like just listening to the West Wing Weekly was also a fun one because yeah. Oh, yeah. that gave so much info on just how Santos was actually inspired by a little known guy known as Barack Obama. And I liked how they wanted to deal with totally different issues while being somewhat similar by showing that Santos is also kind of a sign of someone who provides just an un unusual amount of hope <laughs> just uh yeah but, uh what, what did you guys think of the hbo max special they did <laughs> uh benefit I'm, when we all vote i like the sh i like the show i think the little interludes were a little too much yeah i know that they're trying to like prove a point and like pad out a little bit and like bring home bring it home a little bit but it's it kind yeah. of really killed momentum <laughs> but as far as the as far as what the content of the actual like read through, I thought it was really great. Yeah, it's just one of the Hartfield's Landing, which is a key season free episode where they're showing what the whole going into town for re-election is like, and uh, Toby and Sam doing a private chess game with Bartlett. <laughs> yeah, we haven't talked much about like the supporting, but um, again, one of my favorite moments is when Toby. Anytime Toby and Bartlett really go by that, really. Oh man. And there's kind of like two times that, that I could think of that's kind of going between the two. Was the first one was um, when Bartlett reveals to Toby about having MS and how Toby, uh, yeah. like Toby, again, Toby has this quote, righteous indignation about it. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, you may be the president, the most popular, well known person in the world, but I know something that's going to destroy you. And, you know, you're, you're still, you still made this huge error. And again, I don't get to do the, the campaign I always wanted to do. Uh, I mean, he's, he's just there just his whole reaction is just so intense and also the whole bit before that when he figures it out throwing the ball against the wall mm -hmm. it's kind of like a heartbeat um it's just great filming and great cinema 
Um, and then again, also the point, the one where um, he doesn't want to, he wants Bart to stand up a little bit more and have a yeah. bit more of a back backbone, and he kind of calls him Less out. Less homework that he's got to do, just something to let him know. Hey, I'm not micromanaging you, but I'm really going to tell you, I need this from you. <laughs> Well, but then he but then he goes too far and brings up his 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 um issues with his father and the abuse that he suffered, mm, and that just kind of draw and that goes. Uh, he, I think he's trying to push him and a little bit rile him up, but he goes too far, mm-hmm. and that and then they kind of you know, Marlon says, "No, if you were anyone else, or this is any other president, you'd be fired right now." Right, <laughs> just for pissing me. Yeah, and they really have that off. very. He doesn't have yes men really, which I think is a yeah. rare thing. It's so rare. Oh, yeah. yeah, you know, administrations. So, so you see that these people, these you know, uh, everybody in the executive cabinet and like the support team, they're competent. They know Bartlett on a personal level, which is important because it, that doesn't seem to be a thing in reality very much. They have a rapport, and they push back against him in a very competent way. And so, I recently read the book Fear. Um, about Trump's presidency and the overarching theme of that really good book was there was no one saying no so it would a juxtaposition right of like there was literally the answer was whoever gets to Trump first is the person that is stuck in his mind and they he makes a choice based on the last person he talked to whereas (laughs) in the west that's like obviously this is like the ideal situation but he's like mulling over everyone's idea everyone's option he's always you know meeting somebody to get a second opinion talking to a lobbyist and and genuinely interacting with a human being so even further they put sam um as the lead opposition person they said we put our best guy on the (laughs) on the other team so they don't want the best guy making their argument they want the best guy making the opposite argument so they have to work harder to come up with the counter argument (laughs) <laughs> totally and that keeps him grounded as a character because mm-hmm. you anyone you see like even like in the real world you see joe rogan his sort of change is he's surrounded by yes men he doesn't have somebody that's like he used to have people on his show that fought against him now he yeah. has everybody that plays with him so when you he, get yourself he's into pulled that an adam carolla where now he just wants people who are politically incorrect and known for just being blunt so that way he doesn't have to argue with them and it's like well so it's not legit you're not having a legit conversation you know? <laughs> but yeah that, that yeah, is true it, 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 yeah, it's an I interesting sorry about <laughs> yeah dilemma some people thrive in their echo chamber and we've become those things where it's like everyone has their own little circle or industry that they work in mm-hmm. but I think that's why, like, for me, I was drawn to the West Wing as a kid because, A, I loved politics. I studied poli-sci in college. I, I do community <laughs> activism now, and I re- do nonpartisan work. Um, oh, congrats. And, yeah, it's it's become something I've accidentally fall, fallen into, and now I've done, what, two election seasons? Um, and the West Wing, as cliche as it sounds, was, like, a formative reason why I did that because I saw what politics could do at its best. In reality, you see what it can do at its worst. But I was like, oh, there is a world where there are all these competent people you can work with that are passionate and want to do good. So it gave me a, a hope for what could be. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to say, I took one poli sci class in college, again, to date myself. The date <laughs> that class started was September 12th, 2001. <laughs> oh, so wow. think about the think about the climate of going to poli sci class on that day. <laughs> that would be spooky. Oh wow, yeah, it very was, it was intense. I can only imagine. Um. <laughs> but uh, yeah, also talking about Bartlett's support team, um, Leo is probably my my favorite character on the show. Very and... softly spoken. I love how CJ's and. Uh, as some of the others will always just quiz him and he, he just he likes to take a challenge from them because he knows they're not playing games with them and he find it's kind of funny how they'll kind of just make little quirks with each other and they find out little small secrets they didn't even realize about each other they've been so locked up and serious for so long so yeah there are definitely some it's funny ultimately- interactions yeah it's a workplace right so I mean, it's mm-hmm. just like any other like it's if you work at an insurance office it's just uh, a workplace when you put it down they're gonna yeah. be water cooler mode uh, so i think it dresses down the idea of politics and yeah. makes it manageable accessible and you realize well, these are just people 
Right. Well, and to even go take that like, a step further, there's the whole plot line of Leo's alcoholism and drug abuse. Yes. Um, again, you're taking probably the smartest, the, guy, the one person who's probably smarter than Bartlett, at least like as a tactician. Um, and they're giving and they're giving them what at least what was considered at the time as this big quote flaw. And mm -hmm. um, they really, it's one of the few shows I can think of that really, on the very human level, addresses the realities of that. And uh, again, picking it makes moments, it realistic as opposed to a, the caricature, an overdone PSA where you're like, okay, don't villainize it, just say. Why well, it was the episode where he, <laughs> right? So there's the episode Bartlett for America, where Leo's having to testify about working for Bartlett under the guise <laughs> of finding out about the an MS cover up. But we, mm -hmm. we learned that there, there's this one guy who knows a secret about Leo, or at least like was there for one of the few uh, relapses that Leo has. Yes. And they have to, t and they know, and he determines that this guy is going to make him retell that story in the guise of talking about Bartlett's MS, and which is, you know, obviously a shitty thing to do. And he's just trying to score a political moment to help his career. And Leo, yes. like, and, and Leo tells the story to his lawyer. And he's talking about like, you know, it's not, she asked him, how could you drink on this, this of all days? And he's like, well, how, it's like, how can I not drink on any day? It's, you know, an alcoholic who wants to drink. That's why alcoholic. Right. Or any, I do it. Even if addict. I know it's bad, it's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. It's not about knowing right or wrong. It's, 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 a, it, it's a compulsion. You can't, <laughs> you can't help it. You can, I mean, you can help it. Unless by, you were you know, able to go to a very discreet AA meeting, it's not going to just stop happening. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Like there's things you can do to make it lessen it, work mm -hmm. it down. I mean, as a contrast, like I recently had an unusual uh, moment of uh, insomnia. It's mm -hmm. now under control thanks to Delta Eight and CBD, but that was a very chaotic week. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, as a contrast, though, I mean, alcoholism is sometimes people like to kind of victimize people who are drinking, and it's like, well. It can be managed, but you have to, you know, not everyone can manage it, but you also got to be willing to have this conversation. And if you shame well, that person, they're going to just keep locking up and keep going back to the bottle. <laughs> yeah, and also not everyone has resources to be able to yeah, manage it, it's to, very, to, afford, very... to afford going to um, a, re a, a clinic or have access to meetings or a healthcare, et cetera. So yeah. Leo thankfully has access to everything he needs. And even then, he had like he only had like one slip in so however many years. It just happened to be at this really critical moment um, when he was trying to get these guys to agree to give money. So like he was he was just put under an immense amount of pressure. Oh, a thousand percent. Uh, we even saw the re-election episode, which unfortunately does reveal that he, the character, had passed away because the actor had also passed away. Yeah. Um, well, that was Trump getting killer. elected because it somehow put us in a better mood, even though it's dealing with a lot of stuff. In fact, that's probably the only complaint I got about the show is when they say, "Hey, Santos won Texas." I'm like, I doubt it. There's too many close-minded people there. He would not win that one. <laughs> he might win the Latino vote, but and he definitely not California and the other ones. But I don't think he would win Texas. <laughs> Well, that's the funny thing. Yeah, is the, is the Democrat winning Texas and the Republican winning California? That's where you're just it's like, ludicrous. And today, and maybe then it was a little bit different, but today, no. Uh, you know, graphics back then that might have, but I mean, I feel like Texas is now just finally becoming more blue. So back so, then, yeah, it was ever so, yeah, more, ever so a more. little bit, uh, but there, man, the I, I, since I love there, there are so many just close-minded guys who have taken the fear monger bait they they think that they cannot live a peaceful life unless they got a gun <laughs> it's just like i don't know what to tell you guys because you're not listening to anything else except you know am radio <laughs> they like to loop your well, yeah everybody back. wants libertarianism until they need help from the police and then they realize it doesn't yes. quite right and they, they do never make the some answer. comments on libertarianism which i am happy for because it does seem like so many want to give them a pass and some of those guys can be really pretentious towards like well hold on you said you don't want any government interference but everything you propose requires government assistance so what do you want <laughs> you want you want fema after the hurricane or not yeah do you want government support or not because <laughs> if you cut them out you're not going to get any kind of assistance when you need well, the just only that thing you have to... okay. yeah the only example you have to give the roads and anytime you say who manages the roads and they go the person that their house, I'm like, 
Yeah. If you don't, ma- if you don't order somebody to manage the roads, they're not going to bam, the and argument go. falls apart. Yeah. And they'll just keep going at it. Cause it's, it is kind of almost like uh, conservatives or more corporate Democrats who will keep coming up with something like that is just a, you know, you're just, like you say, you're seeing the holes in the argument. And at the same time, you're just like, okay, so you, you hate this bill, but everything you're proposing ends with, oh, and I don't have an alternative plan. So it's just like, it, it does make you almost wish that if there was any kind of restructuring of any congressional, like, or uh, vote going down in the Senate, if someone could rework it to where if you have no alternate plan to propose, then you can't counter it. You can vote against it, but don't waste everyone's time by standing up and saying, oh, by the way, I have no alternative because <laughs> I, I just hate everything you guys have to propose. I'm a, I'm a child. <laughs> Yeah, but that's where the the culture wars come in and that fear of cultural yes. Marxism. And, that yes. and that's why, like, back circling back to the West Wing, I think they did a really good job of playing the absurdity of a lot of these cultural Marxism <laughs> opinions without being overtly, like, cruel. Like, the the people yeah. that they're, like, like, saying this is a dumb idea, they're sort of, like, in on the joke because they're saying it to them directly, which I really like oh, because totally. I think that... That's an effective way of getting across like, no, you're wrong. Here's why. And this isn't even worth a, a back and forth. And we because the viewers it's so become encouraged because now that we've seen them kind of sneak attack each other and now they're in a closed private conversation that we're privy to. Now we're actually enlightened by what they actually are saying. And we're looking forward to them, whether they're characters or not, you know? And I think season four, when they're actually facing off with the Senate, uh, which is ruled by a conservative leader, uh, played very well by Stephen Culp, who's, you know, was Bobby Kennedy, I think, in 13 Days. And he's he's done plenty of other political politician roles over the years, Secret Service stuff. So it's interesting seeing him, him as well as how, to them, it's kind of a contest. And I like how Bartlett's like, oh, this is a no-brainer. <laughs> We're totally going to take the Senate back. <laughs> but it, it's fun at how, like you say, they they build up that tension by introducing them and showing their human cartoonishness at the same time, instead of just, okay, now we just got too cute with the wordplay. You know? <laughs> but yeah, they yeah. give, they give them enough yeah. rope to hang themselves. I think that's the most effective. Yeah. Anyone decides to uh, base their economy on the American working spirit and picking yourself up by your bootstraps. Might be a little flawed. <laughs> yeah, not recommended. Especially, yeah, they don't make bootstraps anymore. How are you going to pull yourself up by them? Right. <laughs> um, I do. Any- I do want to talk about some of the humor in this in this series because this is very funny. The two moments that I I wanted to talk about were first of all where Bartlett calls the butterball hotline to ask a question about cooking turkey. <laughs> yes. Because again, we put this president on the, as a pedestal, as this like godlike figure almost. But he's still just a person. He can still pick up a phone. <laughs> and he has a question about turkey. You think he has like a kitchen staff and everything, but he learns that there's a service that you can call, which is a real thing, mm-hmm. to ask them questions about cooking a turkey. So he does it, but he doesn't want them to know. So he has to like come up with like all the like he has to come up with like a zip code or you know all these crazy things to uh, mask himself. It's, a, it's such a funny moment. It really is. And it's good at, like you say, just the rare opportunity to see, you know, professional people doing everyday stuff that the public generally knows how to do. But, uh, you know, they, they could have gone so many w- different ways with that. They could have had, hey, I'm the president. I don't want to cook Thanksgiving, you know, <laughs> or uh, I don't want to do the holiday that everyone does. But they went a totally different direction. And it's just kind of fun because it just again, it reminds you that they are humans. They're just got the weirdest profession in the world. And Yeah, and that's um, like the whole MS thing because Bartlett's given the flaw that's not his own, but it makes him so human, which is MS, which is the most debilitating and like incapacitating disease. And he also has like the way he puts his jacket on with that one arm. Mm-hmm. I know that that's a Martin Sheen thing where he actually has a 
injury or something to his arm. Yeah. But it has like where it's like one more physical weakness that like makes him this this fallible character because the season one series one opens with him quoting something saying i am god i'm the god something like that no, he's, he's, he's quoting the ten commandments saying i'm the lord your god so no 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 greater other than me i believe and, and we yeah. see him coming in we don't even see him first so we already have this view of him as like omniscient lording over us but then you realize as it unfolds especially with abby bartlett who's like the the counter to him entirely yeah he's like a person and it makes him even more powerful that he is able to get through all of this and still succeed well in in, in that scene that introduction scene that. you're talking about I'm he's curious. limping yeah. in because he had the bicycle accident so again he's showing off okay. his yeah, he's, he's showing off his brains his amazing intellect and this amazing will and <laughs> personality but physically he's already kind of broken he yeah. says he's kind of like limping through so it's almost like i know i'm a thousand percent sure sorkin did not have that plot line in mind it's already planting the seed. I think that at that point, like a... uh, now that the actors were really in there, he wanted to write for them, you know, just like J. Michael Straczynski would do on Babylon 5 and some of these other shows where mm. they, they literally write for the actors because at this point, they were, they all respect each other and they want to make it even better than what's on the paper. But well, that's, it doesn't always that's happen. That's smart. <laughs> yeah, that, and that's smart filmmaking is writing for your actors and not shoehorning them in too much. Right. And... Or getting mad that now that they took a pay cut as a producer, they've rejected half the dialogue you sent them. So now you got to, you know, delay an episode and rewrite it. It's it, when, when you can, like you say, find that magic in a bottle and then remind each other, hey, you know, we all want the same thing, which is to do a damn good add on to the existing storyline. <laughs> uh, well, that's like I know Sarah Channing talks about when she, her first day on set was. They were at the gala and she was put into a ball gown, had never met a Martin Sheen before and was like, went up to him and was like, I think we're married in the show. And then they just rolled with it. And <laughs> then they saw how great their like role playing was and how great and how like magical it was. And they were like, oh, she needs to be more of a thing because I'm a major Stalker Channing fan. I think she's like the oh, yeah. best actress ever. And... I, and I even think like I used to, I found her through like Lifetime movies. So like that's like if she can make a Lifetime movie like riveting, she can make anything riveting. She, I, and, I, 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 did you ever see Six Degrees of Separation? Yes. I, I, I kind of felt like she was still kind of in that same exact mode. Just the quiet. And if she sees one thing, she puts her husband Bartlow on the spot. What is that's going on? Really cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Have you heard of the movie? Uh, there's a TV movie, I believe, called The Girl Most Likely To. Yeah, that was her in the seventies, where she's yeah. like a uh, ugly oh, wow. nurse gets all the surgery. Yeah, the ugly duckling who goes on to murder all the men that were that wronged her when she, beforehand. <laughs> and I think That's like awesome. they actually played that on like a night of one of the a major election, or there's something about that. The timing oh, of what they did it. I mean, that's ironic, just, but yeah. yeah. Um, well, and I, that was just good casting because she kind of was kind of like a. Martin Sheen type, just someone who'd just been around since, again, you know, late 70s, early 80s, just always just different Broadway and TV and occasional movies. So it was cool to just see that uh, they gave every one of them like a moment to breathe. And then they slowly added in all this other stuff that made their roles even juicier. And uh, yeah, I know, good casting for her because I mean, I really can't imagine anyone else in that role actually. No. <laughs> the playing the first man or the first lady in any kind of political thriller you know i feel like kind of like a any other kind of genre that can make or break it sometimes because you gotta like you say you gotta believe that they actually have some charisma and they actually married each other for something other than just you know pol politics <laughs> and um and they, have to have a, they have to be able to stand up to the other character it has to mm -hmm. like you often times that role they sort of cow down and like fade into the background so to be able to like yes. play with each other and still be able to like be just as equally powerful while having less lines and being quieter that's mm -hmm. such a testament to the actor to be able to get to that level be bigger which, than the scene in, <laughs> yeah well which in real life is kind of what we want our first ladies to do we want them to be these like role models but then also like oh but your husband's the president so we want you to kind of right. step aside and not, not just be much fade away for a little bit 
totally not just be spreading what the other wants you to communicate as part of their overall agenda you know <laughs> mm-hmm. uh there was a recent show on showtime which unfortunately got canceled that was on on the first ladies that was viola davis's uh michelle obama and michelle pfeiffer as betty ford and uh I, it was very electrifying and just kind of showing what sexism they faced back then when they were preaching just very kind stuff like you know exercise after school healthy you're eating for your kids and it's just it really is amazing how uh the first lady can have a even worse kind of just scenario to deal with if you know in today's age it seems like we're we're experiencing even more you know toxic masculinity but we're also encountering just just utter just kind of bizarre people who just want well, to just spite you for the sake of spiting you it's or like, spite. i don't i don't yeah there you go. or spite or spiting you because you have because you're called a doctor and you have a doctorate and you're mm-hmm. you know like the whole thing was, said was so manufactured nice. yeah. insanity just can to have something to th- just to have some mud to throw at someone can you believe he told me how to feed my kid who does he think he is uh you asked for their opinion did you not <laughs> Well, yeah, and the whole thing with Jill, Jill Biden being being Doctor Jill Biden, it's oh, <laughs> yeah. so bad. But well, again, we're getting a PhD show like, too. Ahead. It's like that's so much hard work. Like I'm mm-hmm. trying to eventually get my PhD in English. Like yes. that's going to take up years of my life. So mm-hmm. that that's a large commitment and a lot of work. And so I think that's so childish. But that also speaks to I don't know if the West Wing could be made today. This, a, I think like a lot B, of them believe they couldn't. And I, 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 I'm with you. I don't think it could be because well, it would, it's a reflection of contemporary society. So you could make it. It would just be very, very different. It would, it would not have the optimism. It, you'd have every other comment on IMDb saying I mean, the most it, woke show, and, and you'd wonder why they're watching it other than just to troll people. <laughs> I mean, the, the the best comparison is Veep, which is you know the complete yeah. antithesis <laughs> of the of the <laughs> optimism of that show. Uh, yeah, but they made that so much more digestible. The West Wing, you had to put work into it. You had to oh. research things after. Well, like, it, I would remember when IMDb had those forums where yeah. they would have each show. <laughs> I would spend hours reading those forums. I was I would read West Wing fan fiction. I was like a loser when I was like 13. Sweet. So that was like my fun. Or awesome. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> but, well, yeah. let's just say it wasn't cool, you know, in a circle of, you know, teenage girls. And now it is cool. So it's just is like, hey, guys. Uh, Isn't that ironic? I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> speaking oh, of right. cool, <laughs> there, there's another moment that I, I put down my list that we have to talk about is, you know, we all love Leo's big block of cheese days. Yeah. But then there's the, um, <laughs> the Society, for Cato- <laughs> Society for Cartographers, where they want to redo the map to be more socially. Um, I can't remember what the word is socially uh, fair or, or yeah yeah like it's just, just like, a very petty thing just so he can redo it but and it's a it's like the classic argument of if you want everyone to shut up just go along with it come up with something better that even though there's nothing wrong with the wording just do something so that whoever's got a problem with it will just leave you alone <laughs> i mean they have, they have some things that like yeah you can't it's really you can't really take a round object and put it on you know a flat surface like that no. and just make it seem like this perfect map that does not that's not how <laughs> it works and yes it is kind of it is centered on american european you know lines and everything they're kind of the center of everything so you can see there's a bias there but again it's also like you turn it upside down and you're just like what is happening <laughs> what loophole are we having to put ourselves through <laughs> We'll return after these messages. Hello and welcome to Culture Shocked, the pop culture podcast brought to you by four aging millennials and our outdated opinions. Join us every Tuesday as we discuss movies, TV, games, and even music, new and old. Dude, what do you think you're doing? Are you seriously trying to record a promo without us right now? Well, uh, yeah. Dude, you can't just do the promo by yourself. Who's going to listen to that? Yeah, and you probably haven't even told them that we're a pop culture podcast where we always agree on everything. Uh, for instance, the Sam Raimi trilogy easily being the best of the Spider-Man movies. J- no, no. But I think we can all agree that Jaws is a classical masterpiece. Mm, nope, don't like that. 
but we do all agree that the sequel trilogy of Star Wars is the best in the Skywalker saga, right, guys? That comment is so ridiculous. I don't even know where to Anyways, uh, that'll do it from all of us here at Culture Shock. Thanks for listening. Do you ever find yourself thinking about who would win in a fight between Goku and Superman? Hi, I'm James Gavsey, and on the Who Would Win show, me and my co-host Ray ignore anything important happening in the outside world and debate fictional battles between characters from comics, movies, and video games. We got a new show every week, and almost always, am I the winner? (laughs) Yeah, not true, Ray. In the past, we've discussed such matches as... Captain America versus Darth Vader, Solid Snake versus the Iron Giant, classic matchups like RoboCop versus Terminator, and even the Muppets versus Sesame Street. That one was crazy. So if you're a fan of geek culture and love a spirited debate, check out the Who Would Win Show wherever you get your podcasts, or check us out at whowouldwinshow.com. We let things pile up in the DVR. We add them to our queues. We wait for the DVDs and Blu-rays. We time shift. The Time Shifters podcast. Sci-fi, horror, fantasy, superheroes, comedy, action, film, television, maybe some not-so-current events. Find us on iTunes or at timeshifterspodcast.com. Cool thing about Blind Knowledge is we are in multiple countries. We are worldwide all across the globe. We are in the U.S., we are in the U.K., we are in Canada, Germany, India, Japan, we're in Australia, y'all. BlindKnowledge.com. Now back to the feature presentation. Dragon Ball Z, One Piece, Naruto, all things that we love, all manga that were originally published in the legendary magazine Weekly Shonen Jump. But not every series can run for 300 chapters and have a hit anime. This is David. This is Jordan. We're the hosts of Shonen Flop. Each episode, we look at manga that ran and jumped that didn't quite make it. We discuss what it did wrong, what it did right, how the series could have turned itself around, and ultimately, was it a flop or not? Run all your favorite podcast apps, and you can find us at shonenflop.com. Keep on flopping, floppers. And they did, like, I think they referenced the Peter's projection in the Watchmen remake. Or not remake, but the uh, miniseries. The TV show, yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, I thought was a great call out. Oh, totally. I mean, and it's cool that you guys brought up V, because um, they kind of learned from that and even Parks and Rec. Like, Parks and Rec, they wanted to film it almost exactly like West Wing. And the writers were such huge, fa- huge fans, that's how they got Rob Lowe on that. But uh, it, after a while, it became very clear to them, I'm like, yeah no this doesn't work at all like it it's trying so hard this makes it funny so we gotta do without the camera work but do the exact same kind of dialogue we're doing that's referencing that but uh, i think they almost were tempted to do the same thing with veep as well to where it's like no that just <laughs> it's too heavy-handed even though it is kind of similarly filmed to other hbo shows it's just lean a little back on doing that whole just tracking because <laughs> for whatever reason it just kept killing the comedy that was there <laughs> It is interesting how you have to experiment. You literally have to see what you film before you can decide, hey, that doesn't work at all. <laughs> well, and I think a lot of that has to do with the rhythm. So the dialogue yes. has a rhythm, the shots Staging. have a rhythm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the spacing has a rhythm, the way they're they're walking, I'm sure, had like a certain rhythm too. I mean, uh, the actor plays Charlie Tyrell, uh, I'm sorry, Dulé Hill, yes. uh, was talking about how he used to be a tap dancer and that <laughs> With his rhythm, Total uh, meta because he can totally tap dance and he does it all the time on psych so yeah uh but well, do, do, do you think charlie w- sorry go ahead sorry no i was gonna say and it's the aesthetics of the show too like i don't think that would work in any other i think in parks and rec it would have seemed too sad and dreary the bureaucracy yeah. of middle America like that aesthetic Mm -hmm. so i do think the only way it works is that high level high stakes presidency white house like people want to see glamour they want to have the heightened version of everything heightened version of bureaucracy is a bummer because bureaucracy Mm -hmm. itself is a bummer like i've been to like you know you see courthouses you go to those like rinky dink little local government buildings they're all so ugly no one (laughs) wants to see that right they want to see and they're talking in the curtain and they're talking about how they actually had to pretty up. They, they got reference photos of the real like offices in the West Wing, and they're all just so bland. And this is actually the glamorized version, a lot more glass, <laughs> so you can see through things. And um, yeah, a lot glossier. In reality, it's even much more dull. Oh, uh, totally. Uh, so I can't not mention the 
it's not the mockumentary the documentary episode oh access <laughs> yeah and i just love oh. how cj craig is like stop following me stop it <laughs> go away <laughs> yeah that, that, uh, that's one of my least favorite episodes oh it's not 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 a fun one <laughs> I just uh, so, some shows really... out of place. sorry go ahead. no sorry i said it felt out of place i also think oh, okay. as a character cj craig is so she plays the straight man all the time because <laughs> allison janney is so brilliant i feel like this was her like you know claim to fame the beginning of it all and she basically, in a lot of ways, I think she's so underappreciated. She like was the glue that held that show together to be able to do those long winded speeches, to be able to like move within every facet of the cast and have a different dynamic. That was, I think, one of the first things that also brought me to the show was like the two, like the lead female characters, Abby Bartlett and CJ Craig. They are like the 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 role models I kind of didn't have as a girl, especially growing up, where I was like, oh, they can be, I can be that. Because I didn't see yeah. that growing up in a very like, suburban y, rural y area mixture that I grew up in. So I think that that was a, and you even hear it now, even people that like they do like those cast reunions and stuff. And people always come up to them and say, like, oh, you inspired me to do this. I now work in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. So I think it changed a whole generation of people to pursue something they might have never done. A uh, thousand percent. Like it is not just hey, you know, I got out of being a gangster because I saw him, Michael Imperiali on The Sopranos. Hey, I wanted to be a sex crime investigator because Mariska Hargitay is really good at, you know, on SVU. <laughs> and the same kind of deal here is like, you guys, they did more, you know, uh, Donna and Josh, I think, especially along with CJ and uh, Leo and uh, many of the others, just all kind of incorporate just the overall principles of get your work, uh, dominate your work zone, don't let it dominate you. And then at the same time, like, just be, a, they basically, if they can get one thing that they want passed out of a, a dozen others, you know, they can sleep on that. That's fine, you know, compared to, it was like, you, you see a lot of today's people and you wonder how they sleep when they didn't get anything done this year, you know, <laughs> maybe free things. And so it is interesting how, like you say, they get the glamour, but they also give just they still were able to do a rare kind of breakthrough kind of inspiration that, you know, no one could have predicted when making the show. You know? Yeah. It's, it's wild that I ended up going so long and had such an amazing cast of characters and even like the guest spots. It's like, like Lily Tomlin, like yeah. she's amazing. Like having like her there, like that's such a monumental thing in itself, but to have like 15 other guests that are like, as as good and just having that be a normal thing on that show it's like Kirby <laughs> where it's like he brings yes. Larry David everybody good all the time and it's like oh my god we're so spoiled like it's like we don't realize how lucky we are to have these care like these actors show up to these shows and give us the the best entertainment well I think, yeah, if, you have, I think if you have a hit Emmy winning show and you have a lot of opportunity for guest stars you're gonna attract um a, a great caliber but um also as far as like kind of more side stars amy gardner is just a powerhouse everything she does every episode she's in is just always a good time sure yeah and all together i mean yeah it took me a moment yeah, yeah amy gardner was interesting because it just showed how not just politicians but staffers have to figure out their complex lives i mean i liked how they showed how toby had already you know gotten separated and i think later divorced and was trying to rekindle that because uh, like you guys say they do show the sexy side of it while also showing some kind of legit stuff that would probably happen it's like yeah yeah probably you would be doing great things for the country but you would also probably not have much of a personal life you know yeah or, and what I also what i thought was interesting but also, I thought it was great about Amy is that she's obviously to the left of most of the people in the White House. So she's kind of, we're talking about, uh, you know, align, the alignment of politics now compared to then. She's the one that's pulling them further left when, you know, <laughs> yes. it seems like a, a lot of the other, um, usually people are trying to pull them more to the right. You know, it's all kind of a tug of war, but she's the one that, you know, is calling out more of the democratic hypocrisy, you know, that is that they're trying to brush under the rug often. Oh, a thousand percent. And just that whole deal of, you know, this needs to be passed. And we're past the whole aspect of, you know, 
how much of us do or don't want it to pass. You know, we got to get something passed. So let's just make this be the agenda today. <laughs> yeah. And you wonder the temperature, if it was made today, would Bartlett be more of like a corporate toe the line Democrat, like even to the extreme? Because right. after like this shift, it's almost like, would he be more like a Joe Biden y during Biden's vice presidency where he wasn't he was just sort of was like, yeah, kind of status quo. What sort of Obama led us to, which is like, let's just kind of keep things rolling. And right. then obviously <laughs> the next president, uh, you know, shifted everything. And now we're at this, like, I don't know, center right. Even world. if you have yeah. a left president. <laughs> yeah. So it would be, it would be curious to see as times change, what our presidential dream figures look like, because I think, People would like, on, especially more on the right, would say Bartlett now watching it would be like a, like a like a pansy. Like he's like weak. He's not. <laughs> yeah, he's a pansy. I think whereas people on the right, you know, twenty years, fifteen years ago would have said, "Oh, he's a great family man, great president." So it's funny how our our dynamics shift. I totally. Oh man. Um... <laughs> Uh, who's your favorite staffer who often gets called out? I, I lost track of how, like, if I were to drink, I would take a drink each time CJ yells out, Cheryl, my office. <laughs> um, Probably Donna. <laughs> that would get yeah, you drunk pretty Donna. quick. Everyone's calling Donna to where or it Charlie. is funny. It almost becomes like Archer. She goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then a time on? where she just ignores <laughs> them to go off with her boyfriend for the weekend. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't even have any issues with even the show in general, other than uh, them not giving Sam as much to do that first season. And then, uh, you know, people like to complain about Mandy, but truth be told, you know, that the blame of that is on Sorkin. I don't think uh, the actress, they, he, get, he had too many characters and he didn't know what to do with her. <laughs> I'm like, well, if you create a character, know what they need to do instead of making them be part of your back and forth conversations and no real character growth but i know it's a minor thing yeah but, but i want to yeah but i think that's that. i feel like that comes down to the directing like okay Maybe. tone it down just a little bit i guess i mean i think they didn't really know where it was going because they were trying to make it i mean they had an idea but uh you know the first year is always rough for any show because they're always oh, trying yeah. to make it look just as cool as the other thing that's on after it and you know, they're they're not they're you know the same year John Wells comes out with the ER spinoff third watch, so they're doing the exact same thing, all the steady cam shots and uh rotating everyone around. Um did anyone else find it funny how uh Nancy, the confidential assistant to the president, you know, is played by uh, Martin Sheen's real life daughter Renee? Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I counted the various times she would show up and there'd be plenty of times where it's like, I didn't see her at all in the episode. I think she just, you know, got credited or she's in the background, but you can't make out what she's saying. But uh, I counted the season two and a season seven episode where she actually spoke. I'm like, hey. <laughs> awesome. Now, who who would we put Charlie Sheen? Uh, who, what character would you cast Charlie Sheen as? I, I, I felt like that's what uh, the character Charlie was a reference to. <laughs> oh, oh, I never thought about that. Uh, because uh, sometimes he does go. Is, yeah. Sometimes he does go. My son, you are too cool. <laughs> Keep doing. Yeah, I never, I never made that connection until now, but that makes a little too much sense. <laughs> he's the personal aide, so yeah, he's got to be. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've always wondered myself. You know, was it that was that already on paper, or was that a coincidence? And then they, because his full name is actually Charles, which was at the same time that Charlie was actually changing his name from Charles to Charles. <laughs> Uh, I'm just glad they didn't have any Sh Charlie S characters on there because that would have been just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I have a lot of issues with the last season. It's and I think season okay. four, season five, I'm not a big fan of, but season seven really. And I know Leo's uh, John Spencer's passing, you know, really threw a lot of uh, issues their way that they just didn't really have much time to work through. But um, well, and because you know Sorkin had left due to his you know yeah. drug addiction, and John Wells was kind of running the show, and John Wells, you know, he's a producer, he's not a showrunner, so I've, I've heard that argument. <laughs> but I like season six a lot, actually. I think oh yeah, it's a no, great I, season. I, I'm, I'm but, sure I could find a week episode every that? season. I just like the whole thing overall. <laughs> mm -hmm. Every popular show goes a little too long. It's always oh, yeah. it should have 
season before, but they drag it on for money and to keep other people mm-hmm. happy. It's like mm-hmm. it should end in its heyday. That's why it's... I usually I have a rule where I never watch the last episode of anything. Mm. <laughs> That's a lot. Oh, I mean, that makes a lot. Of, that makes a lot of I'll sense because about it. yeah. But well, I won't you watch missed, it. You missed the, like oh, you no, missed the bullet true. with Game of Thrones. Then um, I've never seen Game of Thrones. Oh, okay. So. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I was not a fan of that, uh, but yeah, uh, no one I mean, was. Uh, well, but I think, just in general, after the five seasons of Game of Thrones, yeah. I was like, "Where are they going? They they are focusing too much on the poon, all on all the black <laughs> battles and all the other stuff, but the characters are kind of not evolving. So what's going on here? And then it just became too much for me. But uh, well, I think I see some oh, people defend it i don't know <laughs> well i think a lot of that a lot of it has to do with the nature of tv where it's supposed to try to get you to show up for the next episode and not come yes. and it not come up with like a ultimately addictive. satisfying conclusion to the whole story that's just not what tv does right it's to get you to show up again it, it, it was pretty so, much it's a roller coaster they want you to go on the ride five more times even though you're already exhausted and can't even pay for it you know it's that kind of it was predicting kind of the binge before binging was a thing. Yes, you know? definitely. So yeah, yeah, that's why there aren't really any that many TV shows that have a very satisfying conclusion. No, that's fine. I mean, truth be told, I mean, the shows that do a good job at it are often the ones that, you know, they they outlined it. Like that's why most people were kind of content with stuff like even Person of Interest and even uh, Breaking Bad because they they outlined that whole six year run. They were just like, this is how we're ending re- regardless of how many episodes we're allowed to film. You know? uh, yeah. That's I, what it should be. It should feel like finite and purposeful and it doesn't have to be purposeful. I love that word. All the, all the dots don't have to be tied for it to be complete. What needs to be complete is that the characters feel, it feels realistic within that realm. And I think that's what shows have given up lately. And there's no budgets anymore for stuff like the West Wing yeah. shows that have that meat to it that will intrigue people. Because I also don't think we have enough of a attention span. I, I can attention span. a thousand percent because it seems shorter, like, shorter. well, and it seems like they only take a chance on a complete unknowns if it's a comedy format. Oh, it's like Parks and Rec or The Office or Arrested Development. Boom. I'll give you, you know, two million you know, each episode. Mm-hmm. And it seems like yeah, if it, it's if it's a regular drama, you need it now. They need to go by the whole you know established movie star making a giant comeback, and they're playing kind of an anti-hero or a villain protagonist. And it's like what that's a whole different formula compared to you know, I take a chance on you because the script is fucking awesome. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's yeah. what A twenty four aims to do with movies. And I think yes. so. I, I so I write scripts, and this is something I'm passionate about. I have a, I'm trying to get a an agent right now to get something made, but it's like, you really almost have to do it on your own because you so like, do. It's like, it's like the superhero effect of TV where it's like, unless it's flashy and big and familiar, people don't care. And well, it's a bummer, and, but it's just. Well, also it's, it's pretty much changed from showing up every week to being a subscriber. Yes. Um, and because everything's so bingy, they just want you to get you to subscribe and then come and then they want to have another show right afterwards for you to watch. They, they don't care about the next season per se, because that's still going to be at least a year away. They need to, they need to keep your attention right now. Yeah. It, it seems like, I don't even know how anyone survives multiple showrunners leaving and what have you. It seems like so many will just like to say that they, uh, it used to be they were literally filming like two weeks apart just to get it done on time. But then after a while is like, if they risk falling behind and having to put up a repeat episode, then it got to where this is like, we need to know what we need to film before we film it. You know? <laughs> uh, but yeah. And... There's no real hierarchy before. like an Aaron Sorkin type. There's no the, like respect of like this person has like, that that higher echelon value so let's really throw something to him so he can make these really elaborate things that he's proven he can head the show because he has the the resume to prove it right well, so, well, well now it's more well now now it's more about having a viral moment 
than having a quality. Yeah, if you're not on TikTok, oh, I don't consider you a star. And it's like, well, does everyone forget when the internet was kind of, no one took it as seriously other than a YouTube video you were quoting? You know, it seems like, like you say, everyone doesn't really, they not only don't take a chance, but then they forget about what they had prior because they're just so spoiled now. And it's like, well, you didn't always have this or that. Just embrace it. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> But easier said than done, because I get it. It is hard to get people's attention because we're our interests are constantly changing and they seem to be worse at even promos. They they must make it look like something else. So then you instantly assume, oh, it's just a it's a knockoff, it's a ripoff. And it's like, no, it's inspired by or made for the same demographic, but it's a totally different show. <laughs> Uh, well because we watch everything now out of comfort rather than like something new because it's so atrocious now that like you need that thing that feel makes you feel sort of like numbed out and safe and it's sad because it's like no the thing that can give, give people comfort is like I don't know. You saw this with the beginning of the dystopian movies with like the Hunger Games. <laughs> the it was the, the balance yeah. of like zeitgeisty and then also like inspiring, like with the mocking Jay Pin and her speech and like the music. It was like that perfect hybrid. And I think that that's possible to do. I think you maybe not need, you need to then as like a, a network, not maybe test some of these shows, but just take a risk. All of these shows that we love were all risks. Tell me. Uh, Dick Wolf yeah, was told Wing, straight Wing. up, you can't have Michael Moriarty leave the show. He's the only name actor on there. <laughs> he was like, then give me someone better because he's not, I, I need to change up and have a different lawyer character. <laughs> and it's just interesting how when networks are just also just afraid to change it up, they are just always afraid that it will be the death of something. Like someone will be dissatisfied. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, it's fine. It's just, I mean, yeah. Outside of sports, the networks are pretty much yeah sports on their they on their will last pretty heels. much keep going until unless they go past like kind of an award show, the free hour mark, then they just have to cut them off and say sorry, we can't air the rest of that. We gotta air the required, you know, local news and what have you. <laughs> oh man, uh, well, who who's everyone's favorite Secret Service agent? I, I took a liking to Michael O'Neill because he's been again been on a lot of these same kinds of shows. <laughs> Like um, yeah, secret service agent on the West Wing, or in general, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah just uh, uh, of all the other, any other supporting West Wing character. Oh, um, no, I'm 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 a big Lily Tomlin fan. I'll go with that. Her and Miss yeah, Lenny. Yes. Oh, I'll just kind of do the combo of the secretaries. That was she did have some good dialogue, and uh, it's so awesome. Yeah, just and seeing. Even... Sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. Mrs. Landingham was also in Desperate Housewives, right? Yes. She was the neighbor. I think yeah. so. Because yeah. I was trying to figure out my mind because uh, I was like, yeah, she or played she that been... excellent. Like, well, that, and that's like, energy. And that's what kind of what happened is that I think she told Sorkin, one of the producers, that she was up for this role in Des Desperate Housewives, and like, oh, interesting. What if she left the show? How would we do that? And that's kind of how they led to the whole killing her off. It's like I should probably should have said anything. Well, when she actually died in in Desperate Housewives, I think they had her die in as a character in the tornado. Oh God! <laughs> What's funny? I can't catch a break. That was like, yeah. So maybe yeah, she just like <laughs> picked off everything. Uh, and that just makes me sad because I did hear an interview with Paget Brewster, who you might know from Andy Richter and Criminal Minds and Community, and uh, she was interviewing her pal Andy, and she. Well, vice versa. He was interviewing her and their old pals, and she talked about how for the longest time, if you left a show and it got canceled or what have you, you were kind of cursed out by producers behind the scenes, like you're the show killer. And it's like, I, I'm not responsible for your show not, you know, maintaining interest. You know, <laughs> it, it's just amazing how producers are just hungry for a scapegoat because, like Jason just said, you know, unless it's sports, nah. You know, who cares? <laughs> well, yeah, because there's somebody to blame. If there's a bunch right. of people on a field sport, it's a little, unless you're the field, you know, kicking the field goal, it's harder <laughs> to blame one person. <laughs> that's my, that's about the extent of my football analogy that I, I you know, it's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not a sports guy, but I respect it. And I, 
I will watch good sports movies like Rocky and what have you. But I mean, it is interesting how Ted Lasso has even made fun of scapegoats, <laughs> gatekeepers in a way. <laughs> and it's not too heavy on that. But it's like you say, it is funny how it it's a common bad habit. And yet, you know, you can't control if an actor has to, you know, wants to challenge themselves on, you know, doing something else. <laughs> But yeah, anyone that's good, you sort of see, you're able to look back with hindsight and see the trajectory of their career. And you realize how many times they bottomed out. Like Stalker Channing, for example, before The Girl Most Likely to, she was in a movie with Warren Beatty that bombed. Yes. And she had thought that was going to be her skyrocketing to fame and it like tanked. And so she thought, <laughs> oh no, I have to quit the business. Meanwhile, all of her best work was like in her 50s and 60s and early 70s. Yeah. So like it just shows you think you're failing. You're on this, you know, downward trajectory when in reality it's more of like a wave. It really is. Yeah. And sometimes it resides back and then you lose your grip on it and then it comes back again. <laughs> uh, uh, we've lost track of how many shows have been not only rebooted, but like returned. And I mean, like CSI came back and I yeah. couldn't stand it at all. Like all the new characters just didn't serve the overall narrative, the, returning characters were kind of just cameos featured cameos and uh but had i only seen those actors in those roles i would have thought they were bad actors but yeah. i think the reason they've struggled to even bring west wing back other than that hbo max special is just they have to really think long and hard what would the characters be doing nowadays that would make well, sense as opposed to can we or can we not get you for this special episode and can we do more than just fanfare? <laughs> yeah, and I think you brought up an interesting point about Stalker Channing. I think a lot of the ca a lot of the cast were either upcoming or had been big, but were kind of on the downswing. Like Martin Sheen wasn't anywhere near as he'd been like in the eighties or so. Yeah. At this time in the nineties, uh, Rob Lowe, you know, had a bunch of scandals. He I wasn't see. doing a ton right then. Oh yeah, Martin and Lowe were pretty much in the same wavelength. Do something with son charlie and then do some other made for tv direct to video mm. an independent festival movie and then another cool mini series and he had done played a president before but they were almost always just voice cameos or like in the yeah well i mean they're on a lot of those characters around the or on tales of the crypt just to tie it back together to there show how much go. they were slumming yeah. it <laughs> um if you want to see richard shift get his head cut off watch tales of the crypt <laughs> tales of the crypt <laughs> If you want to see him blow people up, watch him like. <laughs> but yeah, uh, if you want to see yeah, him torn in half by of... a dino, watch Jurassic Park too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thought about that. Or, yeah, it's like um, they all had these silent careers, and then they sort very of like silent. appear. Mm -hmm. And it was yeah. like you feel like you've uh, found these people, so it almost right. felt like you're proud of yourself. You're like, oh, I found all these cool Pete new actors. But but no, that's true, and I like how you you're chanting because like uh Allison Janney and uh Julie Hill and uh definitely Richard Schiff Toby were all pretty much at the make it or break it time where they weren't sure how longer they would stick with it and I mean, yeah and I Allison Janney was on the Oscar winning movie where she barely said a word just she, sat at the table the whole time she would do those yeah. she would do plenty of other indie movies and just playing kind of the neighbors next door and she's like what the hell's going on here and Schiff was already kind of angry because he had a lot of scenes in speed and they cut all his lines out. So you only see oh, really? him machine gun by Dennis Howard. And so he, they were at that point. And Dooley Hill, I think he said he was best friends with a lot of his other co-stars of other rom-com movies. So he was literally sleeping on his pal Freddie Prince Jr.'s couch when oh, he wow. got that call. And again, yeah, at that point, when you are, you know, shacking up with other people, you don't know if you're going to continue doing this. I mean, uh, all these other people who are hit actors, same kind of story, and people go, "Why wow, didn't they realize how good they got it?" I'm like, they didn't know what they had. They didn't know if they were still relevant. <laughs> it's hard to be relevant to begin with, because <laughs> yeah, no and you need a certain amount of money to survive. Like you're paying your agents, you're paying your lawyers, you're paying, you know, the manager. So like right off the top, that's fifty percent. So I think a lot of people have this misguided idea that these people are automatically wealthy the moment they sign a show like i know sydney right. sweeney the girl from euphoria she was like people were um kind of annoyed with her because she said it was 
like it, she can barely afford her $3 million house. But in LA, real estate <laughs> is $2 million for a decent home. Mm-hmm. And she's losing 50% from her whole deal. So <laughs> she doesn't have as much money. Yeah. She has lots of money. But she doesn't have as much money as people think she does. And that's true for a lot of people that seem like, oh, you're in the, you're in the, you know, uh, the the uh, zeitgeist. You're like in the moment. You have the best hit show, but you need four hit shows to have right. that. So, like, and also HBO, also HBO shows aren't don't have that many episodes in the season. You're getting paid per episode, Ooh. so you might be yeah. a hit show, yeah. but if it's on HBO, you're not getting paid a ton. Well, and writers have it even worse. If you were mainly credited as a producer and the showrunner rewrote your episodes, and you did or did not get the credit, you know, it's still you know. They, they wait forever to even rerun some of these shows to where you still are only making like two bucks to 50 cents per episode. <laughs> you know? uh, I'm seeing some classic 90s shows now that are syndicating now on cable. And I'm thinking, I, I bet everyone's getting five cents. It's just, there's no way they're making anything now because it's been three decades later and they're now syndicating that. And that was probably, I hate to say it, probably the corporate mindset, which sucks because you like to make you know, get paid doing what you love doing. And then at the same time, on the euphoria point, yeah, people seem to think, oh, but you're a privileged celeb, you're beautiful, oh, no, you're famous, you must have it all. And it's like, to an extent, but it could be better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. As Steve, and I think it helps that some actors have kind of reminded others that they're not in a position, they're they're just here to do their job and just be good in everything and worry about their brand, the acting shops versus whether or not the program's worth their talent or worth its weight in peanuts. You know, it's, uh, I, I think a lot of other people like Steve Buscemi, James Spader, Hugh Jackman, and even Michael Caine have all kept reminding others, just stop giving a shit about what movie you're cast for and just do your damnedest, do your best. <laughs> you don't know if it's good or bad until you see it. Or to be fair, if you're too close to it, cause you were part of it. So just let others tell you if they thought it was good or awful. You know? But that's why we need, so they did a study recently where they found out in 1960s Britain, that's where the highest percentage of popular musicians came from. And that also correlated with the highest amount of public assistance for people. So these musicians could get public assistance, federal programs, work their night job or their day job, like as a, a working at a restaurant. And then they were making music all night. It was bands like oh, the wow. Beatles, the Doors, like <laughs> that sort of thing. Band. So it was like, that, yeah. yeah, that era. Um, Be a waiter that, at the and day. I think, you know, like, um, yeah, use leftover yeah, like tips the, to pay for the studio that you're using. Yeah. yeah, and that's not possible now. So imagine all these people no. that could be amazing actors, musicians that we're missing out on because of this brutal economy. So I think a lot of people don't also realize if you want good art, you got to protect the artists while they're in the most vulnerable point. And totally. people don't seem to comprehend that that concept. Oh, and you can be even a great performer, but let's say you got a dishonest agent or some other PR guy who's not, you know, giving you some advice. I feel like so many people will let celebs just run their mouth on Twitter or Instagram and won't pull them back behind the curtain and say, think very carefully before you post that, you know, something, <laughs> you know, because yeah, it seems like they will let them just go out on their own. And if they're not the most mature minded, or there is no solid way to actually save up, then what do you do at that point? Because <laughs> yeah. your agent's got to take a portion of what you got and all that. And, uh, you know, it, it just sucks out. Like you say, everyone's got to do either an Oscar bait movie or a superhero movie or just stick with a show. And they have to get over whether or not they're even used all that well. And there's plenty of actors who I feel like they got to start all over, especially if, I mean, uh, there's actors on shows like these who I would see kind of be in other stuff, but for whatever reason, they only get see, seem to get guest star roles or because even though they made a bunch of money and they were part of the cast, they were still didn't get as many in-depth roles. So they got to start all over again mm-hmm. anyway to prove that they can do that kind of role, even though. I mean, I wonder if the best role or uh classification in hollywood would be like character actor because yeah. you get tons of roles you're constantly getting work you don't have like the biggest roles but you come on for like one or two scenes and you just that kind of but you're the most respected. 
-hmm. You know, that's like uh, Alice and Janney in that movie with Kirsten Dunst where she's in the uh, pageant. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think it's like that Midwestern character. What is that called? Something, uh, Jawbreakers or something. Yeah. I, th I, I know the Jawbreaker is the uh, sugar, sugar and no. spice, I think. I think it's sugar and spice. Came okay. out after one of those other. But I, I think I know I the one you're talking about. Drop, like drop Dead Gorgeous. Drop Dead Gorgeous. Yes, Drop Dead Gorgeous. Yes, that's yes. become a common cult hit for some reason. <laughs> Many years after the fact. I can't believe it. <laughs> Yeah, but at the time it was nothing, no big deal. You swept yeah. under the rug, and that was like that. Alice and Janney was like, "That's just Saul and Ellen Barkin in that role, <laughs> like um, of Kristen yeah. Dunn's support characters. Like those are those are those like character roles that make us fall mm. in love with those people, and it gives us that trust to be like, okay, you're not selling out if you're doing this big thing because you've built up this career and given us these cool things. So we'll tolerate you in the." I, I Tanya felt a little sell outy for me, even though I think she was really talented in it. <laughs> yeah, I her. she was already known, but I, I know what you mean. It, she was good, but anyone could play that role. Yeah, but yeah, but she, she really made, but she played a really despicable character in a way that like you hate her, but there's like a part of you somewhere deep inside that still is she, intrigued. She really was very hysterical her dialogue, but yeah, <laughs> it is one of those just like. She just has the natural charisma to make it like a tolerable, at least just on that. You don't want to run out of the theater when that character comes on screen because he's so awful. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Eventually, everyone does their best Sam Jackson, Joe Pesci role. <laughs> They're like, man, you played it too well. I absolutely hated you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, man. Um, any characters you would have liked to have seen more of that had some scene stealing moments? Uh, I would have liked to see more flashbacks. Mm. I think that would have been more powerful. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's that's a good one. I want more of the the young Jed, the young uh, Mrs. Lanningham yes. flashbacks. Mm. Mm -hmm. That would have been the good like side series, or like just have those a little bit more often because the, because they did such great casting on that. They played so well off of each other, right? Uh, I'm with yeah, you. Or prequel show that they had, you know, it's like Jed and Abby meeting her in medical school, them raising their family, you know, the path to, because it would be different actors. It could mm -hmm. still be true to the story and it would still feel fresh and new. Totally. I kind of like, wanted more could... uh, Bailey and uh, Harper, the NSA advisor, you know. Oh. McCormick as well oh. as Will played by Melina. It oh. seemed like they kind of were a thing, but they didn't really focus on him all that much. <laughs> oh, here we go. Um, John, the, the the woman from the Wonder Years who played um, Joshua Melina's sister. Oh, Dana McKellar? Dana yeah, McKellar. Dana. Yes. She just awesome. disappears after a couple episodes. I, will love, I love her. Yeah. She's great to have on. For longer. Totally. It seemed like they wanted just Annabeth, Kristen Chenoweth to take her place. <laughs> Oh, I totally yeah. forgot about that era. Yeah, mm -hmm. underappreciated, I feel like. Totally or underappreciated, Mrs. yeah. <laughs> more um, Mrs. Santos, I thought she was really fun. Oh, yeah, Terry yeah. Polo. Terry yes. Polo. Yeah. Uh, really, really yeah. underrated, yeah. <laughs> or uh, more Glenn Close and William Fitchner as the Supremes. Yeah. As the Supremes, yes. That that, that Some of those one-offs really were just very well casted where you're just like, I and now this... Uh, I tied those two up there with uh, James Cromwell mm -hmm. as a former president. Forget all the people, but they're all so good. Yeah. Oh, yeah that, was, so good. that was a weird episode, though. It was a weird episode, but I just thought it was just interesting, just reminding viewers that previous administrations, regardless of whether they, you know, give a shit about each other or not, have to pay their tribute to a fallen president. And yeah. I just oh. loved how it was after... Uh, uh, Bartlett's daughter had gotten kidnapped, and John Goodman had, you know, stepped yeah. in as the temporary. But I'll, I'll always take more John Goodman. That would be a good one. Uh, yeah, and that was another thing that didn't age as well because he's like we're so used to his weight loss now. But yeah, this was before he, you know, got those notes. But it was interesting too how he 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 was nothing at all like Bartlett, and yet he kind of respected the guy. <laughs> he's like, we're just doing our job. <laughs> you do yours, I do mine. <laughs> You just listing off all of those just really made me forget how many good, like, we keep oh, yeah. harkening back to this, but I'm just like, oh my God, 
just every so like James Cromwell. I totally forgot about that. I or, always uh, think the of mom him from my mind. Holman... Oh, don't or worry. JK... Ron Silver and the Ron Mom Silver. From Home Improvement were the advisors to Alan Alda's Vinick senator. I thought that was cool. Or uh, J.K. Simmons. They, uh, it's always the random military guys. So, yeah, I J.K. Simmons. About him. Uh, James Colvin Morrison. Bell the, from the Saw franchise was on like an episode. Colvin Christian Bell was Slater. On Christian Slater. Gerald McRaney was in like three of them as one of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, Ryan Catrona, who's done a lot of similar government advisor roles in plenty of other mm-hmm. movies and shows. I, I love how I think there's the, he does the whole will you drop the ball moment. <laughs> it's like for whatever reason, Bartlett never likes him. He always hates what strategy he gives him because it just doesn't make sense to his repertoire and then sometimes it's like they challenge each other uh but i I really grew to like michael o'neill's secret service agent character because like he did the worst possible thing which was we're doing this practice test run you know secret service you know simulation and no one can know about it because then they will never forgive you for that you know if they think it's not real is that Butterfield? I think so. And that, okay. just the actor, Reed Diamond, who they cast as the doctor, I thought was interesting, even though they don't linger on him too long. But I just thought it was interesting how just, you know, just to remind everybody, you got to be prepared for the inevitable. And it's not easy to do because it's kind of reminds you, you know, when you were in school and you would do the uh, fire test, you know? <laughs> Well, and that was when like the anthrax scares were kind of happening. That was like a yes. real world kind of fear. Uh, the SARS virus, yeah, SARS, years before yeah. COVID, yeah. And nowadays, so many people just want to pretend it will just go away, and it's like it's not how viruses work. <laughs> or I mean, there's even an episode with like uh, where they have mad cow disease, and I'm like, oh, I remember mad cow came along yeah, for a yeah, minute. It was creepy, 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 and no one talks about it anymore. And it's like, well, then we're just doomed to repeat it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <sighs> yeah, it makes you forget. Remember how Ebola was such a big? We thought it was oh, the yeah. end. We realized My how brother got few it. people. Oh, yeah. What? Uh, yeah. Oh, oh my god! No, not not Ebola. Uh, mono, 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 mono was another okay. one. Or swine flu. Or, or swine flu. Like, all those other ones where it was just like, how did you get it? I don't know. No, I'm, <laughs> I was working in healthcare when swine. I've been working for healthcare for like almost twenty years now. But oh, okay, I remember when it. when swine flu came out, and I was like, we we're all getting really concerned about that. And it turned out, oh, it turned to be a bit of a nothing burger in the end. <laughs> well, it, was, it was just the warm up. Well, and I think because even before we were having to actually do research on who, which reporters do their job and which ones, you know, play to the corporate heads. It's interesting how. Back then, we were already kind of getting tired of post 9 11 type reports. And at the same time, we, it still was easy to fall victim to, to get attracted to, oh, can you believe so and so did that? It's like, well, let's do some extra research. (laughs) Well, COVID's the new 9 11. We're going to have this whole saga of COVID related media. And we're going to look back on it now. Yeah. We we already do. If you like, especially like for in the horror genre, there's already tons of, uh, Hmm. COVID-related movies. Much like, much like TV just mm-hmm. tries to get it done. A little slower. We're, we're the yeah, same it's way. Gonna take care. We try to get it done, and then we leave ourselves vulnerable and open for the next disaster. <laughs> well, that was the big thing, like, rip from the headlines. Every episode was rip from the headlines. <laughs> yep. And now I'm like, put it back. Put it back. Take it back. <laughs> leave it in the headlines. Take me somewhere else. You're right. <laughs> I don't want to be part of this awful version of the world. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyone who deserves Emmys besides everybody. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone just got one. They just they everyone got an Emmy just everyone for showing up. Should. And if, I feel if like everyone was on stage award, at that point. Yeah. 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 Give give it to definitely Jenna Maloney as Donna. Give it to Rob as Sam. Give it to any of these guys. <laughs> They give it to crafts it. give it to craft services the give craft it to uh, security <laughs> give it to the cinematographers and editors yeah <laughs> yeah everyone's it's so funny you it's rare that you see a show where it's like every single person you're like yeah i'm not, not mad at who like mm-hmm. they all deserve it i don't care which one gets it like they're all competent oh there are like, times when you even see actors who are even on shows later together down the road where you're like yeah this was their future casting call <laughs> There was one episode that had Rocky Carroll and uh, Michael Norrie, you know, again, 
established character actors flash stands in chicago in all respect <laughs> they're on ncis later together but i'm like yeah i'm pretty sure some producer saw that like the show and said get both those guys on my show <laughs> uh yep. james morrison was this one joint chiefs guy who like the entire time is like the episode revolves around like the president getting briefed while he's on the phone on the presidential plane and I was just like, hey, that's Bill from 24. He, at this time, he would have just done Space Above and Beyond and all these other shows. He's just a very cool, gray-haired guy. It was just uh, that voice made him feel all the more presidential worthy. It's just like good casting on all of these one-off characters who literally have nothing else to do besides provide bad news to the chief of staff or president. You know? Oh. Yeah, but, but they all feel believable in, they're all like, obviously the characters are the most aesthetic versions, like the, the most attractive versions of those characters, oh, yeah. but it all felt believable. Like they still were like, not like Margot Robbie, like beautiful. Like Allison Janney has that character actress face. She's yeah. really pretty, but like odd looking. And I think that they did so well with casting people that are aesthetically attractive, but unique. And it makes yes. it believable. You yeah, because I love that they put it. Rob Lowe as kind of the dorky Princeton guy who's like obsessed with musical theater. <laughs> a good foreshadowing uh, of his off life troubles. But that that takes him that down thing. a notch sometimes. That like brings him, you know what I mean? That makes him a little bit more likable rather than like, you know, oh my God, heartthrob, well, jock, yeah. bro. And they had Bert. to. I think they figured, hey, Josh is yeah, exactly. and mm -hmm. Donna is overworked and stressed out. Yeah. If we make him like either of them, then they're just mirror images. So we have yeah. to make him more wacky and comic relief. He's the right, guy so he... who takes a drink in the middle of the day when he has no business doing that. <laughs> yeah. Right, because I think they, they probably wanted him for the Josh role. Um, I, I did see some of those. They, they did a lot of switching on the guys and gals. Same thing, like the uh, uh, Donna actress uh, did say that she was up for CJ and then they gave her mm -hmm. you know, Donna instead. And so I thought, interesting. I I think you all would have owned each role, but I mean, even when they brought Emily Proctor on here I, as the Texan gal and John Larroquette, I thought those were interesting too, because I've never, I've never seen either of them do these kinds of roles and they really haven't since. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder what other cat what the casting director, what else they've done because the casting was okay. Casting here. director West Wing. Josh Frank Levy. He was known for casting China Beach, Jason's favorite ER. So all the John Wells shows. Now he's recently casted Shameless, Sill Team, Animal Kingdom for TNT, and American Woman. Okay, nice. So a lot of the same kind of thing overall just a lot of those just everyday kind of dramas that but primarily just john wells productions but uh as another fun shout out one of his earlier roles were growing pains and adventures of briscoe county jr so those alone are just oh. badass <laughs> growing pains was like my favorite rerun i would watch ever that would be best. Uh, like St. Elsewhere, yeah. it seems like they just forgot to re-air it in recent years, and so a generation as a result doesn't seem to know it as much, which is weird. It's like, why do you just stop airing stuff? <laughs> it's like they want us to forget half these shows that came out. <laughs> yeah, like, who's the boss? That was yeah, way before man. my era, but I, like that was like what I grew up on, was like, who's the boss? <laughs> How many fans are we? was like my imaginary dad. Uh, right. I was watching the menu and the woman from Who's the Boss is in that. I was like, throw back for a few minutes. Uh, Judith Light, I think. Oh, Judith Light, yeah. 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 Angela. And yeah, Angela. <laughs> yep. <laughs> nice. That's a good show. I'm I'll gonna let my dog out really quick. I'll be right back. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I have to log off soon. Okay. Yeah. Look. No, and I've I've kept you guys long enough. I'm. Uh, so glad you were all able to be on this episode because this is why we like doing these recap of these favorite shows. If you remember these moments, why we now have re-illustrated to ourselves why it's immortalized in our heads, you know? Mm -hmm. It's more than just it works, but we know why it works. We know why it inspires. We know why it kicks ass. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and so, it's like a camaraderie to be able to have all of us just chat about it and feel like you're part of a group. Because sometimes when you're watching alone, especially growing up as a kid, 
I felt very different than all my peers watching something like The West Wing when they were watching like CW Six shows. I... <laughs> Survivor. <laughs> yeah, I know. Why aren't you watching that? It's the coolest shit ever. And, well, and they all have their place and their moments, but this is a show that really makes you think. And you know, this is a show you want to watch every day. Part of your brain. Yeah, they should still rerun it. <laughs> that uh, as of uh, this year, they've just started rerun running it on HLN. Oh, really? The CNN what? sister channel. So I thought that's cool. It literally has not been on cable TV in like decades. <laughs> Maybe Telemundo because that's Universal owned, but. Mostly it would just re-air on Bravo. And I'm like, I don't know why they didn't re-air it on something like CBS or something. Something that, and kind of like 24, they would always give a lame excuse. Oh, you got to watch every episode. I'm like, you could still syndicate some of it or re-edit it, make it work. And same thing here. It's like, they just want to avoid anything with a political context, even though yeah, it's got plenty of entertainment value for any other genre of completists. I, Yeah. Like, like like I said before, I think everyone wants to, certain vice presidents of programming want certain content to disappear, which is just stupid. If there's a fan base, why not acknowledge it and get more easy ratings? <laughs> I don't get it. No. But it was a delight having you all on here, and I gotta let you guys promote your show. So, uh, Jacobs, what do you got coming up? So, I'm revamping my podcast. I took a oh. three months off. Um, sort of I've just needed to figure out the voice for it. So I think it's going to have a focus on my experience through life going, dealing with like mental health things and just being like an eternal optimist, but also an, you know, an existential nihilist in a lot of ways. So it's called the happiest sad person podcast. Right. Um, you got some wonderful paintings on your Instagram. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I, I'm publishing a novel this summer called death in the time of suburbia um that hmm. should be out i'm hopefully going to self-publish and then Congrats. yeah i just applied for a program to for film and television writing so hopefully i get into that and then i'll be i'll maybe writing a show someday that you'll be reviewing <laughs> very nice okay very cool and jason again dynamite always love your sit downs i love mondo's take on mental health i love you guys even picking everyone's brain on how you guys got into metal music and how you can even just tell, remind other people, you know, I do this all the time with even comedy and action. I, I mention it and I encounter snobs who are like, oh, it must be a psycho. I'm like, I like entertainment of this kind. And same thing that horror fans have unfortunately encountered. There's so many who look at them like they're freaks. And it's like, what the hell? <laughs> no, I think horror, especially the last year, has really taken off. I think it's a really solid post-pandemic genre. Um, yeah. I think you've seen the, the world get more and more horrific. Everyone's and now realizing what, you know, it, it's Cameron a very cathartic. The George Romero's of the world were just, mm -hmm. they predicted <laughs> mankind's downfall. <laughs> right. So I think, you know, it, it's a very comforting genre for a lot of people to see that. So, you know, my show is dedicated, at least for now, on the Tales from the Crypt TV series. And we're about halfway through the second to last season. Yep. So uh, the pace we're going, we'll be done with the series sometime, I think, in August. So yeah, we're going to go through a little, probably reformat of some kind. And I'm so... Oh, I, I have no doubt that you'll probably, with all the other guys who have crossed over in those, you might end up reviewing all the different Twilight Zones, Outer Limits type yeah. shows in that gallery. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we're still figuring out exactly which angle we want to take with it, but, you know, <laughs> I think we've made a, we've, we have a format where you can really talk about anything, and, you know, but then, you know, what, oh, we, we, we talk about metal, <laughs> we talk about horror movies, we talk about food a ton. <laughs> yes, and, then we give, and then we give questionable dad advice. And who doesn't want that? Questionable. Um, it's not questionable. It's awesome dad advice. Sometimes it's questionable. We don't, we don't claim to be, we're well, that's why seasoned I give you guys amateurs. Because you don't do the whole, hey, I'm not an expert. This is just my experience and my time. Because <laughs> so right, many other people so, will make the mistake that, I can relate to all this person and that person is like, well, you're from a different lifestyle or you're retired and privileged. You're not going for the same experience that this troubled person is going through. You know? mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think we try to have a little substance to everything we have. I don't know when this episode is going to come out, but soon, we have an episode this week. Hmm? Soon. <laughs> Very okay, soon. We have a great episode coming out, which is like one of the few Tales to the Crypt episode that has any sort of LGBT uh content so we had um some great 
people. We have a writer from The Advocate. We have a trans author uh, mm -hmm. come on to talk about that and kind of recontextualize the, you know, the problematic episode from uh, the 90s. Yeah, we've had the horror queers on. So, and I love, I just love having different voices. I love having different guests and also talking to all the wonderful directors and people that are involved in the making of these shows back in the 90s. And, oh, you know, I've got awesome. plenty of plenty of other things with um, Al Katz and Gil Adler, the producers from the original show that we're cooking up. They're so patient um, with the guys and they bring a lot. And I, I'm glad you were able to even convince them to do it, you know, especially with what shit went on in both their lives, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I think we came along at a time. Wanted to kill himself when Trump got elected because the world was just so grim at that point. And he was already dealing with other you know, relapsed memories that he had tucked away. And so if anything, I like to say it's a healing show. Yeah. It's 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 a feel good show in its own way about a movie about people trying to murder each other and screw each other over and <laughs> morality tales. So I guess that's the morality tale is um, you know, find a way to feel good. Somehow, somewhere. It's fine. Find your happy spot, no matter what it is, as long as you're not hurting someone else. Totally. Or yourself and, too much, but well, and and good job on you, Jacobs. And I do wish the best on this show because we do need more optimistic podcasts. We need mm -hmm. shows that can tackle a different subject and open up all our minds. And I think people are getting used to, especially in you guys' case, a show that's a little bit of everything, a little bit of variety. I mean, there's plenty of people discovering podcasts just because you use, you know, kudos. You use the right keyword. You used something in the title that got them working, and now that opened the portal to them wanting to follow you and see what else you had to offer. But uh, I think 2024 is really, or 2023 is now the year to just truly evolve. Like we can do no wrong at this point. <laughs> yeah. It's been a happy accident and I've had fun. Every, every other podcast I've gone on, I've had nothing but a good fun experience and met really cool people. So it was really nice meeting you guys. And this was really fun. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a Jack Review Show.